Hi guys, welcome to Building and Securing Government Sites in the Cloud. Um, my name is Chris Strahl. I'm introducing today's panel of speakers. Uh, we have uh, Michael Meyer. Um, he's the Director of Information Security at Acquia. Uh, Chris Brown, a Technical Account Manager at Acquia. And Jim Salem, the uh, Vice President of Cloud Services. So we're going to be talking to you guys about uh, security, um, the cloud, and how we do it um, for our various clients at Acquia. Go guys. Thank, thanks, Chris. So just to uh, brief you on what we'll be covering today, uh, we're going to be reviewing uh, the current uh, U.S. government compliance landscape, where we are now, where we'll be going. Uh, we'll talk about how uh, cloud service providers such as us and others can achieve federal compliance. Um, we'll be uh, talking about uh, international uh, and developing compliance standards uh, related to U.S. government standards. Um, we'll be taking a look at uh, case studies, a uh, particular case study that uh, we've worked on at Acquia, and then we'll be looking at uh, how Acquia has achieved compliance for our hosting platform. So first I'd like to uh, touch on the opportunity. Um, you know, I think that uh, everyone realizes that uh, U.S. Uh, federal compliance can be uh, quite a mundane and boring topic. Uh, this slide it makes it really interesting for, for everyone, I think, um, that there is a lot of opportunity for, for in this uh, sphere. Um, so, you know, first, um, Drupal. Uh, governments are expanding the use of Drupal, um, not only in the U.S., but in the internationally as well. So why is that the case? Um, you know, Drupal is open source. I think, you know, everyone, uh, there's, is, realizing the, uh, the benefits of open source in terms of uh, it is cost effective, obviously, vis-a-vis uh, -vis proprietary uh, licensed software. It has been proven secure. It's used by open source software, including Drupal, and many other platforms is used by uh, firms across the world, uh, hundreds of thousands. Um, obviously, uh, it's proven itself to be a secure platform. Uh, and lastly, in terms of uh, Drupal, uh, Drupal facilitates uh, agencies to share work amongst themselves. So one agency uh, may develop a, a custom Drupal solution, and they're free to share it with other agencies across government uh, without any charge. So you know the federal government has prioritized a uh, cloud-first strategy. Um, it's very exciting uh, for us as a cloud service provider. Uh, Vivek Kundra, he's a former uh, U.S. federal CIO, uh, put out a white paper called uh, Federal Cloud Computing Strategy last year, and it spelled out what the strategy was for the federal government in regards to the public cloud. A um, couple key points, uh, the, the paper outlined the recogni recognition of the fundamental shift that we see uh, not only in the federal space but across the IT landscape, uh, the shift to cloud computing. Uh, in the white paper, he targets uh, $20 billion out of the $80 billion uh, federal IT spending uh, for cloud services. Um, that's an annual, uh, annualized budget. Um, he, um, you know, uh, cloud computing represents significant cost savings for, for government and, uh, of course, for us all as taxpayers. So, um, you know, there's multiple uh, benefits for all of us. Um, cloud computing allows uh, government to, you know, just as with the private sector, to more quickly change. Uh, it's more agile. It's uh, it's easier easier to scale. So it's much easier to provision uh, services on the fly than it is to have to procure, set up, and manage your own your own infrastructure. Uh, similar to what's going on in the U.S., we see we see similar uh, initiatives uh, in the U.K., Australia, Hong Kong, all over the place. Um, so we think that this, uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, we see this uh, uh, gestating and continuing over the next few years. Um, so we're, we're excited about that. So currently, um, in terms of U.S. government compliance, uh, there's two main drivers or standards. Uh, there's FISMA and there's DIACAP. Uh, FISMA is, uh, is a legislation that came out in 2002 and it's applicable to uh, non-Department of Defense agencies. DIACAP is a very similar um, standard for, for certification, and it's applicable to uh, Department of Defense. 
So with both FISMA and DIACAP, each uh, information system must be documented, reviewed by independent third-party assessors, and authorized. It is an extremely time-consuming and expensive endeavor. It's highly inefficient. Um, it's, it, it can be frustrating and time-consuming. Um, so, you know, this is the current landscape uh, that uh, I think, you know, agencies and, and, and service providers are, are all dealing with. We're very excited uh, uh, about FedRAMP, which, which is aims to solve that, that inefficiency uh, problem. Uh, so FedRAMP is an initiative that's been uh, uh, formulating over the last year or two. Um, it's uh, due to become production, uh, uh, a mandated federal authorization standard uh, for cloud service providers uh, this year. We expect it, uh, according to um, what's been uh, publicized, uh, sometime in the next three to six months. So FedRAMP is an authorized once and used many times framework. So um, whereas uh, you know, uh, FISMA and DIACAP, each system, in our case in a Drupal shop, each website has to be uh, documented and authorized, um, FedRAMP allows a solution to be authorized uh, once and allows any agency throughout government to leverage that authorization. So that is such a, uh, um, such a more efficient model, it's gonna save a lot of money for the, for the federal government. Um, that's why it's very, you know, it's very interesting to, to Acquia. So FedRAMP is based on the same uh, NIST publications as FISMA and DIACAP um, with additional controls added that are pertinent to cloud environment. Uh, recently published is the FedRAMP concept of operations. It, it, it outlines how FedRAMP will work, um, who, the responsibilities and ownership and process. Uh, it, it's very similar to FISMA and DIACAP, um, and it's outlined in, a, uh, in that memo. So I wanted to uh, touch on, uh, you know, important to FISMA, DIACAP, and, and FedRAMP are are NIST. Uh, NIST is the National Institute of uh, uh, Standards. Um, it defined, uh, NIST is the agency which is tasked with defining uh, these publications, which are best practices um, that government, uh, agency, uh, government agencies and, and the accreditation um, um, uh, utilize in order to, um, to meet uh, their, the uh, control objectives. So. The, uh, the most uh, highlighted, some of the important ones here. Uh, FIPS 199 is, is what starts the process. It's, the, uh, it's how you categorize your information system. So what compliance objectives uh, do you need to reach? Um, so FISMA is basically, uh, a FIPS 199 is basically a, a spreadsheet which lists um, many different um, um, uh, details about um, the confidentiality of the data that the website will host, uh, what is the availability requirements, um, are, 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 are there any, uh, any data uh, pertinent to national security, what are the uh, implications if the site goes down. So going through uh, the FIPS worksheet, you will arrive at um, different ratings for each category, for each of those three categories. You may, you may find that confidentiality, uh, there's no confidential data, low, but maybe uh, the site, the availability requirements are, are important, so that may get, get you to a medium. So based on that categorization, you arrive at a, what's called the high water mark. So the highest level of rating for each of those categorizations um, is what your system is rated, it must meet, and then that turns into the, uh, the requirements uh, based on the next NIST document that we'll, we'll touch on um, must meet. So NIST 853 is currently at uh, revision three. Um, these outline all of the controls uh, that must be documented for a uh, information system. So NIST uh, 53 is div divided into uh, the all the various domains of security, covering everything from physical security, uh, how do you do risk assessments, uh, what is your personnel security, 
How do you onboard new, new, user, new employees, new staff? Do you do security training? Um, how do you protect the environment physically, uh, environmental controls, um, and to, to, every, to the uh, application itself? How do you manage authentication, logging, et cetera, et cetera? So NIST 853 is like the Bible of security controls. The FIPS 199 worksheet determines what, which of those controls are necessary to meet. So low, medium, high, um, there you have a lot more onus to, uh, to um, imp implement a lot more of the uh, NIST 853 controls uh, you know, based on whether you're low, medium, or high. Uh, NIST 830 is uh, risk assessments. It's, it's about doing uh, vulnerability scanning. How do you determine risk for your environment? And how do you uh, apply uh, the, how do you uh, adjust your security controls in relation to the risk that your system may face? So I just wanted to touch on the uh, high level process for, this is for all, all three of these uh, standards, FISMA, DICAP, and FEDRAP. So the first step, as we talked about, is categorize your system using FIPS 199 worksheet. Then, based on what your cat categorization is, uh, select the controls from uh, NIST 853. Um, then you must, you know, obviously you've, the controls uh, are implemented in your system. Um, and the main document in your uh, what's called your package, the, uh, the, the paperwork that gets uh, submitted to the uh, authorizing official is called your system security plan. So your system security plan is outlining, is, a, uh, is like a book which outlines uh, what is this, it describes the system, the website, and then it takes every single NIST control that is applicable to that system and describes how you've implemented the controls uh, relevant to your system. Um, the, another, one more uh, kind of uh, important piece is the uh, privacy impact assessment. So is there any, you know, privacy obviously is becoming more and more critical for, um, for uh, uh, information systems. Um, is there any privacy data, personal information being uh, uploaded, and what are the uh, ramifications of that? So you've documented your controls. You know, obviously this is a lengthy process. Um, the next step in the process is to assess the controls. So there are uh, the third party assessors. These are independent firms, they're like an auditor. They come in and they review your system security plan and actually test your system. Do, do you do what you say you do? Um, and then based on that, uh, that, that's a lengthy process. It can be time consuming and expensive as, as we, I mentioned. Uh, based on that, there's two, two uh, documents that, that come out of that, the STE, and the POAM. The ST is basically, here's what the auditor, the independent reviewer found. Uh, here are the controls relevant. Um, you know, it, it did uh, the uh, pro service provider or the uh, system owner, did they meet the controls as, as they've described? Um, and then the POAM, you know, no system is going to be 100% in line with the NIST controls. Um, it's very extensive uh, and a, a very high bar to reach. So, the POAM is meant to document the things that are not yet in place, but it's the plan of action to uh, ensure that you are working on uh, fixing those things that have been outlined. So it's not, it's not a matter of being, you know, 100% in line with the, the NIST 853 controls. It's a matter of documenting them accurately, having a third party assessor review them, and create a plan of action to ensure that you're meeting the, uh, you're addressing them and you're moving uh, in order, uh, towards compliance uh, with all of the controls. So that package including, you know, all of those documents are given to uh, an authorizing official in the federal government. Um, that uh, AO, as they're called, um, reviews the, uh, the documents. They, uh, they have a back and forth with you as the service provider um, the, uh, they'll have comments, uh, maybe, um, you know, some control is not documented uh, en enough, perhaps it's uh, the format of something. Uh, it depends on the person that's reviewing the, the package. Uh, hopefully, uh, based on that uh, review process and the, uh, the back and forth, 
uh, that author authorizing official will, uh, will then grant the um, IATC or the ATO. So if, if you don't get a full ATO, ATO is like the gold ring that you want as a service provider authority to operate. Um, uh, if that's not granted, you will hopefully get an interim authority to connect, and that's basically the um, authorization to go live with your site, and then you have 90 days to, um, to uh, fix things as the uh, official has outlined for you. And then finally, you know, once you've gotten your, um, your uh, authorization, the process is pretty much never ending. Um, you must continue uh, updating your system security plan as the system changes. Um, you continue to fix things that you've identified as weaknesses in the POAM and in the STE. Um, in FedRAMP, uh, the process uh, requires uh, reauthorization every, every three years. You must redo the process. Uh, but hopefully, uh, you're updating your documentation as you go forward. So, uh, cloud is kind of a new, is a new thing for, uh, for the government. And, you know, these, uh, these um, compliance standards, um, they weren't really designed with cloud in mind. So we had to really, we had to really think about how we addressed, um, uh, uh, you know, the documenting our compliance and, and obtaining compliance uh, in a cloud model. So we, we think we're, uh, you know, cutting new, um, new ground here. Um, and we think we've got a good way that we've uh, we've a, a good approach to uh, documenting the controls and and um, achieving compliance. And bas basically, what it is is so you know there's there's three types of um, of cloud environments, right? There's a software as a service, uh, an application, so uh, provided to you know the, an agency, uh, pre-built application. There's platform as a service. Um, platform as a service is. Uh, you can build a platform within, you know, a, within an environment that's been designed to support such a platform. Um, an example that, that we do at Octave is, a, is Drupal Gardens, is software as a service, um, and then a platform as a service is you know, Aqua Managed Cloud. You can build a, a, a Drupal site in, in Aqua Managed Cloud's platform as a service. So in both those cases, um, they are built on an infrastructure as a service. Um, that's what, uh, in Aqua's case, we use Amazon. So our cloud is built on another provider's cloud. Uh, we're a SaaS, we're a PaaS, and they're an infrastructure as a service. So how do you, that's kind of a complex uh, environment to try to demonstrate that we're every piece of the puzzle is in line with all of the controls. So the way, our approach, uh, we need to, every control, every NIST 853 control uh, we've divided it into responsibility layers. So there's the application layer, which is, you know, in our case, Drupal. So the application layer can be uh, the responsibility of, you know, the, the Drupal um, can be fully in compliance with the, uh, the requirements or it could not be, depending on how it's developed. Um, so where, who's developing the application and who's managing the users uh, uh, as they're provisioned uh, in the application uh, through its lifecycle um, that's the uh, entity that's responsible for the application layer. So in some cases it may be the agency, in some cases it may be a third party developer, uh, and in our case uh, sometimes it may be Aqua who, who also does some development. So then there's the, uh, the operating system stack. Uh, in our case of Aqua Cloud, it's the Linux uh, LAMP stack. So this is what we do to manage the, um, the operating system, Apache, PHP, uh, Drupal, uh, as, they're, uh, as they're managed throughout our cloud, uh, that's what we do. So we're fully responsible for the OS uh, stack layer. And then there's the infrastructure layer, which is, uh, in our case, Amazon. So that's the data center. How is the data center physically uh, secure? How do they uh, manage their network infrastructure? Uh, how do they manage their HVAC and their electrical that services the, the data center? So those are all, in our case, uh, Amazon responsibilities. So the main, the main point is um, the authorizing official, they want to see that system fully documented, every single piece of the stack and every single control. So how do you, how do you address that? So in, in Aqua Managed Cloud, as an example, um, you know, we're, this is a, a PaaS built on Amazon's uh, infrastructure as a service. Um, and kind of sh we show the picture here. 
Um, so Aquas uh, responsible for the application, Lampstack, um, and from where we, we live inside of Amazon's AWS. So in the 800, in, the, in our system security plan, um, this is how we've done it. Basically, every single control is built, is divided into three sections. Um, the application layer, the LAMP stack layer, and the infrastructure layer. So the Aquia Managed Cloud System Security Plan is where we've worked on it for FISMA, DIACAP, and, and currently for FedRAMP. Um, we have to document every single part of the stack. We need to describe, is, is it the customer's responsibility? Typical in the case of the Drupal layer, um, the LAMP stack, tr typically Aquia responsibility for our purposes. Um, and then we'll describe the control. How do we secure the access? How do we do, uh, um, you know, authorization for our uh, for our privileged users? Whatever the control is, and then um, and then the in the infrastructure layer is is the responsibility of Amazon. So our approach is basically uh, we work very tightly with our partner Amazon here. Um, the authorizing official, uh, when we go for our uh, our, our certification, uh, is basically going to get our uh, our system security plan for Amazon, uh, for Acquia Managed Cloud, and they're gonna uh, read through that. As they go through each control uh, at the infrastructure layer, we're referring to Amazon system security plan where that control at the infrastructure layer is fully documented. So the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the, there's gonna be two big books of system security plan. Our responsibility is covered in this one. Amazon's in this one, they cross-reference to each other. And lastly, we have a, uh, a control mapping. So uh, we'll, uh, it's a spreadsheet which shows, you know, for each control, uh, who is responsible. Some controls are entirely uh, Amazon's responsibility in our case. For example, physical security. You know, there's no, no case where uh, Acquia is responsible for physical security of the cloud environment. Um, so that's what, you know, it's the full package that we're providing at the end of the day to the, uh, to the authorizing official. That's been our, that's our approach uh, in the shared responsibility model. So moving on, I uh, just wanted to touch on, you know, how, how uh, uh, FISMA and, and the NIST standards and FedRAMP can, how do they relate to international standards? Um, the main international standard uh, which other governments utilize is the ISO standards. Um, ISO is the International Organization of, for Standardization. Um, the main, in, in, in an IT uh, environment, the main, uh, the main standard is the ISO 27002. Um, and it's very similar to the NIST 853 in terms of its approach. So um, it's a, a list of best practices um, through, throughout, you know, for everything from the same domains of security that NIST covers risk assessments, policies, human resource personnel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, base, uh, in regards to ISO, there are two, two levels uh, of, of compliance. Um, so a service provider like, like Acquia, um, you know, we, can, uh, we have the, the ISO standard. Um, we can go through each control and we can do a self-evaluation. Do we meet the standard? Um, you know, yes, no. Uh, where where the answer is no becomes our gap analysis and our and our plan for achieving ISO compliance. Um, once you've uh, established yourself uh, and you 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 you've done your self evaluation, you could bring in a third party, much like a, a third party assessor for, uh, with FISMA, uh, to evaluate your um, your controls. An independent auditor to to validate that you're in compliance with the ISO standard. Um, from that, you can achieve ISO certification. Um, one more, uh, just wanted to touch, there are many, so many standards of security uh, and best practices out there. There's one more that's kind of important for, um, for the cloud environment that I want to touch on, the Cloud Security Alliance. Um, so the Cloud Security Alliance is, um, is an organization uh, made up of uh, industry uh, leaders in the cloud space. Uh, users, uh, associations, and, and some vertical uh, markets uh, representation. So basically, they've they've produced a couple initiatives. The CSA uh, has come out with um, the CSA Security Guidance. It's a publication that uh, produces recommendations and and guidance for cloud service providers. 
um, similar to NIST and, and ISO. These are best practices for particular to cloud environments. So they're a little bit uh, further developed um, in regards to a cloud service provider, which is, you know, a little bit unique uh, um, from, uh, you know, traditional IT. So, uh, and then there's the uh, CSA Consensus Initiative Questionnaire. Um, this is a list of, uh, of controls or questions um, that a service provider like, like us uh, goes through and we validate uh, do we meet this control objective, yes or no, um, and then this, and, and how did we do that, and then that we publish this um, uh, up on their CSA's website, um, and that's, that's used uh, for companies, whether in government or more typically in the private sector, to evaluate cloud service providers. Um, are they meeting best practices as defined by the CSA? So, there's, you know, there's abundance of best practices. You know, we talked about the, the, the main ones in the federal space and international, um, and there's so many more. Um, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately for, for Aquaway, we're, we're serving customers in healthcare, so we've got to deal with HIPAA. Um, we have uh, some UK specific customers that are interested in ISO and COBIT, uh, financial sector, there's SAS 70 and the BITS Shared Assessment Program. They're all designed by different vertical markets to uh, achieve the same objective. Are you meeting best practices? So how do, you, uh, how do you meet them? It's a lot of work to try to document and, and read through each standard and validate that you're in compliance with this whole range of, uh, of computer standard, of industry best practices. The Cloud Security Alliance has published something which helps a lot in that regard particularly to two organizations like us who have prioritized uh, FISMA and NIST standards. Um, because we have uh, aligned our controls with FISMA, well, it turns out that we've also aligned our controls with ISO. They may be in a different section or different wording, but the gist of it is the controls uh, are, are similar. Um, so the CSA has come out with a control matrix uh, which shows the uh, all the NIST 853 uh, controls and maps them to all these other standards. So that's a great help to us as a service provider. Um, how can we ensure that we're meeting compliance? Uh, we don't have enough time to, um, to um, you know, attack each one individually. We can leverage what the CSA has done to validate we're meeting control best practices across this whole range of standards. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Brown, who's going to talk about our uh, one use case that we have. So before I start, I mean, who here has actually had to go through a FISMA or a DICAP accreditation for any type of application? Okay, good. So there's some people here who can empathize with our, um, you know, the, what we had to go through to actually make this happen. Um, so I'm talking about uh, DSEA um, GlobalNet. Um, it's a uh, social networking um, application that we created for the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, uh, DSCA, um, underneath uh, the development team branding of Team Firebird, which includes uh, Mer Merlin International as a prime, Acquia, VML, Form 1, and Navigation Arts. Um, so as part of that platform, um, we actually provide out a lot of different capabilities. So we weren't actually having to go out and credit just like, hey, here's Drupal Core, or maybe here's Drupal Core with a couple little um, pieces onto it. But we were actually providing out for blogging, for uh, event management, for actually doing emailing, kind of like Facebook emailing with the private messaging um, capabilities, SMS messaging, um, some file management, chat, discussions. So there was a lot actually into the um, platform that we actually had to get accredited. Um, we actually uh, got our package delivered um, August of last year. Uh, I believe it took us about six months to really put together. Uh, I think we can do it a lot faster now for a couple different reasons. Um, one was our strategy on how we actually put together the package, which was actually splitting up um, the actual documentation and the policies and controls for the infrastructure side which now we can actually leverage across all of our hosting partner, all of our hosting customers that actually want to come in and be FISMA compliant or DIACAP compliant because now we can hand them that set of documentation and then the application can ride on top of that, inherit those controls and actually just have to worry about implementing the application layer controls. So um, it did take us a while to actually get done, but it is done. 
Um, there were a number of components that we had to actually work with other than Drupal and their traditional LAMP stack. Um, we were dealing with PWIC for doing some analytics to make sure that that was secured up. We had a um, deal um, initially for our chat capabilities with uh, Jabber and the eJabberD server. Um, but we are actually moving over to Comet Chat and the Ajax Push Engine to uh, use our, for our chat capabilities coming out uh, at the end of this month. And for uh, user management, we're actually using OpenLDAP um, to help us actually with some compliance standards. And the whole system was based off of the Drupal Commons platform, um, which is actually a uh, Drupal 6 uh, um, release distribution. And we were writing, obviously, on top of the managed cloud, which was providing out for our LAMP stack, and on top of the Amazon EC2 cloud. So I just kind of split it up there as far as, like, you know, where are the pieces of, um, you know, the cloud uh, architecture from SaaS, PaaS, and infrastructure as a service. So um, there were some things that we actually had to take care of that people probably don't really think about all that often when they're building out websites. And one of the first things is, is that making sure that people couldn't actually be logged in on two different computers. So we actually had to go out and make sure that um, when someone logged into the system, that the other session was actually logged out. Um, and what's great, again, about Drupal in the community is that we had the ability to do that utilizing the automatic logout module. So that um, proved to be um, relatively simple to pull in, um, implement, and, uh, and drop it in and, and be compliant. A related uh, piece of code, which we actually had to do a little bit more work with, was the ability to block users on um, failed attempts, and then also to actually based on those attempts, when they could actually try again on another, uh, um, sorry, where they could actually try again after a specified period of time. So we actually had to do a couple different things there. One was actually to create a uh, cu custom module to where we were querying our, um, our LDAP database and counting the number of failed attempts to log into LDAP. And we tied that into the login security module um, to actually perform the uh, uh, lockout and the block of the user. The other thing we had to do is make sure that people were actually logged off after inactivity. So people weren't allowed, aren't allowed to actually log on to the site, leave it open, and have it open all the time. So after um, 20 minutes of uh, time has elapsed, we actually had to log the person out to make sure that you know, other people weren't coming in and actually using their session. So again, we used the automatic logout module for that. And then finally, kind of in conjunction with uh, the infrastructure team, we actually had to put uh, CLAM AV onto each of our servers so that because we were doing file management, when each file was actually uploaded into the system, we had to actually scan that uh, file for viruses, verify that there were no viruses, and if viruses are actually found on a file, reject that file and not allow it to be loaded into the system. So those were some of the little things that we actually had to think about that you know, typically when you're going out and building websites, even when they're authenticated websites, you may not actually kind of think about. We also had to do, because we're dealing with things like PWIC, LDAP, um, chat systems, um, all our third party uh, communications had to be encrypted over SSL. So there's no ability to, um, to do any type of HTTP uh, traffic. Everything actually gets redirected on the website and um, talking between all of our components over HTTPS or in the case of talking to LDAP over an LDAP-S protocol. Uh, next, one of the reasons why we did use uh, LDAP for the uh, user authentication was not only do, can we use that for our system of record for who our user actually is within our system so that things like chat, our uh, website, PWIC can actually go to that system of record for the users for uh, authentication, but also it helps us to be compliant to FIPS 140-2 um, which states all the uh, type of encryption standards that you have to comply to um, when you're building out sites. And one of the things that you have to encrypt um, is user passwords. So OpenLDAP makes it very easy to uh, utilize SHA-1, um, which is FIPS 140-2 compliant, to actually encrypt those passwords for us. And then a lot of the stuff that we had to actually think about um, wasn't necessarily uh, technical in nature but it goes around the idea of governance. So making sure that you're writing out the, the policies of how users are actually um, activated on the account, um, how users are reactivated if they've been blocked out, um, 
you know, what role should users, new users in the system actually have. Uh, we had to make sure that um, when we have site admins come on, not only do those site admins actually have their site admin account, but also a non-elevated account so that they can do most of their work in that non-elevated account. And then two, we actually had to create a policy so that user one wasn't utilized. Um, you know, if you go in and everyone's using user one as an admin, you don't know who's making that change. So it's really an auditing um, policy that you have to come in so you can actually see every change that's made on the system by a user. And um, that's why we don't allow for user one. This is probably one of the more interesting slides. Um, I myself had gone through accreditation um, and some previous uh, jobs in the DOD. And you know, a lot of stuff was um, relatively easy because I was running inside of DOD accredited uh, data centers. So I was able to inherit all those controls. Um, but with the cloud, it's a little bit different, especially within the public cloud. So within the um, intelligence communities, there's um, the idea of called common criteria, or NIAP. And again, this is another set of standards where you actually put um, uh, you know, a set of code, your application, into the uh, intelligence community to actually validate it and actually give it a, a rating on how secure it actually is. Um, and you'll hear terms like PL135, um, which kind of talk about the levels of which your uh, code is actually conforming to. So you can actually be utilized in there. But again, that's a long-winded process. Um, you know, a lot of people never even really make it through. So um, Drupal has not gone through that, but you know, within DiCap, they actually asked for it. I mentioned the governance around user one. Um, that is important. We had to um, take user one um, from a group standing that multiple people knew the password for it as an accepted risk. Um, within our die cap package. Um, haven't really found a good way around it um, other than just making the password and dumping it, but I'm not really sure that's really what we want to do. The other issue is multi um, tenancy in the cloud. And, um, you know, because no, we're not only we're sharing hardware, we're sharing software a lot of times, and probably most importantly are the disk drives for the hardware side. And what we found is that for the security personnel, we really had to do an education about all the security boundaries there are um, within the cloud so that we could actually share all these resources out there. And you know, within DiCap, within FISMA, um, you know, one of the things you're always going to find is they want separated um, hardware for all the applications. And that just does not happen in the cloud. So there's a lot of education you have to do with the security officers who actually go looking at your, um, at your packages. And then finally, um, Mike kind of touched on this earlier, is that shared responsibility model. We have to work with Amazon um, from an application side. I have to work with, the, um, uh, the man, uh, with our managed cloud um, within Acquia. Um, and so, you know, we have to start building out, like, where do these swim lanes reside? So who owns security at what level? Who owns the performance at a certain level? So what are the SLAs we have to build between each of these organizations? to ensure that we can actually meet the demands of our customer. So those were some of the kind of more interesting things that we found out that were some of the challenges that we had in getting accredited. So I'll turn it over to Jim right now to talk about what we implemented for the uh, infrastructure. Thanks, Chris. Um, well, we heard about the compliance process uh, from Michael and heard about the application level security uh, from Chris, and I'm going to talk about uh, the infrastructure layer, the, uh, and specifically about the managed cloud service that we put together to really support compliance, not just for DSA, but a number of uh, government customers and eventually uh, commercial, uh, comp uh, to meet com commercial compliance standards as well. Um, and it really breaks down into these four areas I'm going to talk about is the Drupal stack itself, how do we make that uh, robust and secure, and then the management around that stack, because again, we're, we're managing servers uh, for hundreds of customers, and we want to make sure that we can manage those consistently and make it reproducible uh, so we don't have to go with, through hand tweaking uh, separate compliance processes for each customer. We're really excited about FedRAMP and the ability to roll out um, infrastructure at lower cost 
uh, for, many, uh, for many federal customers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the policies and procedures from an operational standpoint that we need to put in place. And then uh, to me, and, and as an engineer, it's all about testing. How do we make sure that these standards stay um, uh, what we think they are, that they work, and that they're reliable? And uh, the key thing with compliance is you got to start early. You got to almost start earlier than the engineering of these solutions because there is so much work to be done uh, to put the, together the documentation. Uh, this is a high level architecture diagram of the Acquia Cloud. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here. Uh, some of it's very conventional for high availability architectures. Uh, some of it is our own special sauce, uh, but we have information on our website. Uh, there's also uh, Barry Jaspin did a uh, a uh, good presentation on it a couple of years ago in the San Francisco uh, DrupalCon. Um, but uh, essentially, as, as you know, we're built on the uh, Amazon uh, Web Services EC2 uh, cloud, uh, and they've taken care of that uh, first level of certification, uh, FISMA, FISMA uh, SAS 70. Um, and then what we've added is uh, infrastructure to make sure uh, it works for with a, in a high availability configuration. I want to talk a little bit about high availability uh, because that's something that's been very uh, key for some of our federal customers. One of our customers is uh, uh, FEMA and they have a requirement that no matter what kind of disaster is going on, um, the site stays up and running. Um, so one thing we do is for all of our managed cloud customers, we split the hardware into two data centers. Uh, Amazon calls them availability zones, but they're really data centers. Um, and so uh, one load balancer in each data center, uh, the webs are split in half between data centers, uh, and the databases and file servers are split between the, the data centers. So essentially an entire data center can go down, the website will stay up and running. Uh, and uh, you know, that's especially important with the cloud uh, because uh, you can have failures and you have to be able to recover from those uh, seamlessly. Um, I haven't pictured our multi-region replication, and that's something that was key for FEMA. They wanted to have both an East Coast presence and a West Coast presence. Uh, there's some real challenges with that with Drupal, doing active-active uh, multi-region failover where you have uh, a significant latency between the data centers um, is really not uh, practical for uh, uh, various reasons in Drupal. I'll be happy to talk about it uh, afterwards. I don't know of anybody that's succeeded at it. If somebody out there has, please let me know because we'd love to do it. Um, we use for um, we use a, some software called Tungsten for multi-master replication within MySQL. We've had very good uh, experience uh, with that, and I know uh, Procona has also released some technology too, which promises uh, to do the same. Um, I think our real secret sauce at Acquia for what we've done is the uh, management architecture we've built around this. Um, and again, I think any time you're going to build a out an infrastructure, you're going to need to have some of these components for a fully compliant infrastructure. So again, this is somewhat Acquia specific, but I think this is necessary for anybody building something in the cloud that uh, needs to meet um, uh, compliance standards. Um, you know, the first thing is controlled access to, to the boxes. You need to have two-factor authentication uh, for sysadmins. Um, whether that applies to Drupal as well, I think in some cases it, it might as well for admin access to Drupal. But certainly access to the boxes themselves has to be controlled by two-factor authentication. Um, can't share accounts, that's sort of the equivalent. Uh, Chris mentioned uh, you can't have people using the user one account. Likewise, you can't have everybody using the root account on Linux. Uh, so everybody has to have their own login and then accomplish the task you need root for uh, using, uh, using sudo or something similar. Uh, and then we also have a bastion host uh, that, every, that all the sysadmins have to log in through uh, and that gives us an audit trail. Who logged in when and did what and you have to go through there to get to any of our production boxes. Uh, backups, um, a lot of times uh, compliance requires uh, disaster recovery and backup plans so automating the backups uh, piece is important, having, you know, just depending on somebody to do it by hand periodically is not the way you want to go. Um, the configuration management is an area we've put a lot of time into. Uh, you can see I have that circle with the sort of our cluster of managed cloud servers, different uh, setups that's supposed to indicate, it's kind of hard to read, but it's supposed to indicate um, uh, lots of different customers in there that those other servers uh, service. And we have a centralized configuration database that keeps track of uh, what kind of servers we have deployed uh, for each customer, and then using uh, software like Puppet to automate the software deployment, 
as well as using our own custom scripts that we've developed to manage configuration files, allows us that even if you know, Amazon lost an entire data center and we had to rebuild things from scratch in another data center, we'd have all that configuration uh, information uh, stored and ready to go, and we could bring up new servers literally in minutes. Uh, and again, that, lets it, uh, that makes it very auditable by people who are reviewing compliance. Uh, and it makes it that we can consistently roll out secure uh, services. And if there's, for example, a critical security patch released, right now we have about 300, about 3,000 servers that we're managing, and we can roll out those uh, security patches uh, literally within within a few hours across all of those servers using that infrastructure. Again, this is probably overkill for most people, but I think many of these components you do need to build out a secure um, and com uh, compliance. Uh, uh, compatible infrastructure. Uh, monitoring is also critical. We use Nagios and a bunch of uh, other stuff on top of that. Um, policies and procedures, uh, again, this is where you'll spend a lot of time meeting compliance. Um, important to just, just start with it. Start, get, get what you uh, uh, can, get what you can work with. There's some examples out there on the web that you can uh, uh, work with, and there's certainly a lot of consultants out there that will help produce uh, the policies and procedures. Uh, it's got to be written down and you have to follow them. The auditors will come in, they will ask everybody on your team, how do you manage this? And if it doesn't match up to your written policy, that's something that's going to go on the poem that Michael talked about and you're going to have to address. Um, those are uh, a few of the key policies you have to include uh, on that. But again, the, the uh, NIST 853 document will define all those um, that, that you need. And then finally, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of testing. Uh, realistically, uh, if you don't test it, it's not going to work. It's not going to meet compliance. So uh, things we do at, at Acquia is we audit, we, every night we are running a full battery of tests on all of our software and management systems. And we'll actually spin up a hundred different server instances uh, during the course of the night uh, just to make sure all of our automated processes uh, work. Uh, and those tests include both positive and negative security tests uh, as well. Uh, and that's one way that we can manage all these servers and, and maintain a high degree of reliability and uptime. Um, ongoing vulnerability scans are important. Um, we use uh, a couple tools in this area, um, Rapid7 and what's the other? Uh, Qualys. Qualys. Uh, to, the, to perform security scans on it just in case something slips through and that's often a, that's often a requirement of, uh, to meet the compliance requirements is having these things run on a regular basis. Um, and then for things like automated failover, you want to test, uh, you want to actually test the failover. We did something with uh, FEMA where we tested the failover from West Coast to East Coast, uh, and they were very excited. It, it, uh, uh, it actually took, uh, you know, 10 minutes to completely fail over their application, and that delay was largely in the CDN uh, they were using uh, to do it. But, you know, my experience, a lot of years in the Internet space, is if you don't test it, it doesn't work. Backups won't work unless you test restoring them. Failover doesn't work unless you test it. Um, uh, and then you also want to test your processes. What's your escalation process in an emergency? Uh, hopefully those don't happen too much, but if you do have a security incident, uh, denial of service attack, uh, any kind of uh, compliance or vulnerability issue, uh, what kind of processes do you have in place to handle those? And again, you want to test those. Um, so that's all I have to say, and we have uh, some time uh, for questions. And uh, Chris Straw will mediate that. Thanks to our panel for coming. Appreciate it, guys. Um, I'll go ahead and take any questions and relay them to the group, and they'll, they'll answer them. Anybody? Go ahead. Yeah, for the die cap accreditation. Um, if, yeah, we oh, need sorry. to research. So the, the question. question was um, if they could leverage our documentation for, um, for accreditation. So, um, yes, if you bring um, a customer onto the uh, Acquia Managed Cloud and you have to go through DIACAP accreditation, you can leverage those uh, documents because uh, what you would be saying within your application uh, documentation is that when you see control that is based around infrastructure, you say, I inherit from the Acquia Managed Cloud, and if they need to see that documentation, we can hand that off to them 
or, or to use to hand off to the to the proper people. There's one up here, I think. Okay. It is, it is, a, I mean, so a SHA-1 is a hashing algorithm. So the hashing and encryption, sorry. Um, uh, yes, everything is hashed so you can figure it out. I, I've just been told that we can actually have people line up at the microphone in the middle of the, the aisle that have questions, and that way we'll get a nice line and queue and we uh, don't have to repeat the questions as they're said. Uh, building on the, <clears throat> is on? Building on the first question uh, about using your documentation for compliance. Are, uh, with Amazon being ready, FISMA compliant, uh, are you waiting on FedRAMP for that to be compliant from Acquia's side, or, or are you going to do FISMA compliance in the meantime? How's that going to work? So we're, we're, um, uh, we have initiatives for DICAP, uh, FISMA, and FedRAMP. Um, you know, we have existing customers who required uh, a DICAP CNA process. We have existing customers who required a FISMA CNA process. Um, and we're really excited about FedRAMP. Um, we're working on a FedRAMP package for Acquia Managed Cloud. Uh, we're working really tightly with Amazon so that we have two packages that will um, be lever, you know, that will work together for FedRAMP. Uh, we want to be ready right out of the gate. Um, now, FedRAMP is the same, you know, uh, the same as FISMA with extra stuff. So the package that we're creating for FedRAMP is really our, our best effort. We're putting a lot into it. Um, we'll, we're able to leverage the work that we've done for FedRAMP. For any, um, any agencies that want to host in Acquia Cloud uh, that need to be, you know, that need to uh, go through FISMA CNA before FedRAMP goes live. So basically, we're including all the FISMA, you know, related controls, plus the, we'll, we're also going to include the, the FedRAMP controls um, in, in our documentation that we can leverage uh, again and again until FedRAMP goes live, and, and then hope, you know, once we get FedRAMP uh, authorization, hopefully we won't have to go through again and again. Does that answer your question? so much have a question as a comment. There are a couple things that you guys said about Drupal 6 that don't apply to Drupal 7, and I want to make sure people knew that. Um, the, the encryption requirements don't require LDAP now. Drupal 7 actually uh, allows you to, to select multiple en encryption uh, capabilities for passwords. And um, there was another one, too, that you guys were talking about that doesn't apply to D7 anymore. Um, I understand the commons is, is an out for D7. There is a code sprint on Friday, so whoever wants to participate, please do, because I really want, I, we're getting ready to use it for our organization. But um, some of the compliance things you guys have to do may not necessarily apply for folks who are coming along behind you. Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, that's why I, I wanted to be very specific when I was pointing out what our accreditation boundary was, that we were using Drupal 6, if people All knew right, that. Thanks. On the testing, are you using any CI testing, and what are you using? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat the, what, what testing? Are you using any continuous integration testing on the Drupal part of it? Yes, and, exactly. And what are you using? We have um, a build server that uh, runs every night that, that, that builds uh, our, uh, you know, all of our management software, and then uh, we run uh, system tests on that, which uh, uh, take about an hour and a half to, uh, to run through uh, all the different configurations we support. Oh, and one thing I didn't mention earlier and I think was left out is uh, one of the ways, um, one of the concerns about shared disks uh, that we've addressed is having an encrypting file system. Uh, so DSCA, for example, encrypts all the data that's stored on the disks and that helps meet those uh, standards. Hi. Uh, have you guys worked with any federal courts? Uh, uh, not yet, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, you know, I'm from California, and we represent the, the largest federal court in the nation, and Washington is extremely strict when it comes to, uh, you know, system assessments uh, to the point where they don't allow any inbound traffic uh, to our websites at all. And uh, my question is, in terms of LDAP, uh, if we're going to have user authentication using LDAP, how would your system be able to uh, integrate that, given that we won't allow uh, any type of uh, 
inbound traffic to our system. Well, or to one thing that uh, one thing that often is allowed is is, v is ac inbound access via VPN. I don't know if that's true in right, your right. case, but okay. often you can set up a VPN. I should have uh, mentioned that, but it, that is something we support in uh, in managed cloud is. Uh, VPN access, uh, which is the way people usually work around that. You can also encrypt uh, LDAP and authenticate it via uh, 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 client-side SSL certificates uh, as well as another option. But uh, VPN is usually, that's met that issue when, we've, when it's come up before. I'm sorry, just one more question. Uh, and this is about cost. Uh, is, 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 would this be a hosting part, would, would this be part of a, uh, Acquia uh, subscription, like enterprise subscription, or is this a whole separate uh, uh, cost? And the, and if if that's the case, uh, do you have any documentation in terms of a uh, cost or estimating cost for, uh, for 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 your services? Well, it's it's very it's specific to the particular customer, but it is part of an, it is an Acquia enterprise subscription. But the compliance uh, piece, uh, especially for FISMA, is a substantial additional cost to pay for. You know, each FISMA uh, accreditation requires a separate uh, set of documentation for that, so uh, we charge for it separately. The hope is with Feb FedRAMP we can actually package it up and have a very standard offer. But I'd be happy to talk about uh, cost afterwards if you want to um, talk about that. Sounds good. Thank you. So I work with uh, some local governments that I know are planning to go in produ into production with Dev Cloud as versus Managed Cloud. Can you contrast sort of what, both on a from a compliance standpoint, is also just and also just a practical standpoint, what considerations DevCloud users should be thinking about as distinct from managed cloud? Yeah, so uh, DevCloud is, uh, DevCloud is, uses the same technology as managed cloud, but it doesn't have the high availability. That's really the, the biggest difference between it. Uh, it's a single server integrated environment, uh, but it has the same UI, same management uh, tools as managed cloud. Um, the, uh, the challenge with that is usually, the comp right now, the compliance piece, especially if you're trying to meet FISMA standards, uh, you know, the, the, the cost for just the compliance piece is, is so dramatic that it almost makes sense to go to managed cloud uh, in that case. Uh, but we're also looking, uh, all of the compliance work that we're doing applies to DevCloud as well, and especially in the commercial sphere, and as FedRAMP comes on board, um, uh, you know, that's something that would probably apply to DevCloud, but you know, we haven't really, uh, we don't have a specific offer there yet. On a related note for Drupal Gardens, do you have any uh, governments yet looking at those in production, and have you done any looking at how those would map on the certification? Well, for our, our enter enterprise uh, Drupal Gardens, where somebody gets basically their own private version of Drupal Gardens, uh, and we have a, a couple customers on that now. I think I don't think we've formally announced that, but we have a big announcement coming. I'm not sure, but uh, that's something that we could uh, uh, we could certainly do compliance for that. I, I think it's a little bit more problematic because Drupal Gardens is a multi-tenant solution, so um, haven't really given that a lot of thought of whether we do uh, compliance there. But again, the compliance costs, the auditing costs are so high uh, that you you might be think it might be a, it might be a better fit to that. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's something for us to think about, especially again, FedRAMP I think is a real game changer here, uh, and just like Amazon has introduced uh, you know a Dove Cloud hosting service specifically for. For government, uh, that's something as, as FedRAMP comes on board, we might uh, consider for the rest of our product line. Thanks. Anyone else? All right, thanks a lot, guys.